Good morning, Bay City Church. Happy Sunday. Pastor Eddie here. Um, been a crazy couple of weeks. I don't have to tell you that. I think you know that. I think you understand the uh, kind of the weight on our country right now, on our cities, uh, with the protest and the violence, the riots, and the uh, murder of George Floyd. I think you feel all of that. And you may be wondering, you know, why haven't I specifically addressed that from uh, the pulpit or I guess from my dining room table? And if you're not thinking that, well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, the reason why I haven't is I thought it was prudent for all of us to really take a beat and to calm down. I think me personally, I feel like I felt really angry uh, about what happened. I felt uh, despairing. I felt confused. I felt upset. And uh, I thought it was good for me to have a little bit of time before I can clear-headedly address um, what the Bible has to say on what happened to George Floyd. And uh, in, in God's timing, we're gonna be going through joy and conflict uh, in Philippians chapter four next week. And so I thought that would be a great week for us to have uh, the time to share what it means to really experience God's grace and glory and experience joy in conflict like we're all experiencing. And so I hope this uh, few weeks will be helpful for you as well to just take a beat and um, let some of the emotions subside so that we can clearly all experience what God has for us in the text. That being said, this week, I'm still going to get to preach to you. And so that's coming up in a little bit after our worship. I love you. And uh, I hope that our, our time together will be helpful the next few weeks. And I hope to see you guys in actual person real soon. Good morning, Bay City Church. It's Sunday. We're glad that you guys are joining in as we worship together. And I want to begin by reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 8, it talks about the Christian and it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed and always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. I know that so many times uh, we are promised that being a Christian, um, things are going to get better, and they do in a sense, but in this life, things don't necessarily get better, and we go through circumstances, we go through trials, and what we are encouraged to do through this passage is to, through the circumstances, to remember that we are not going to be destroyed, we're not going to be perplexed, but we can still carry the body and the death of Jesus so that we can also share Jesus to others through our trials. And this morning we get to do that as we sing through whatever trial you guys might be going through. I want to encourage you to sing these songs aloud to worship Jesus and to bless His name. So let's do that together, church. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out And yes, I will Lift you high in the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy all my days Oh yes, I will I can same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. to 
but yours is all of the victory. And Lord, because of that, we can come and we can praise you with confidence that you are alive. And Lord, that we through that, we can also have the assurance that we'll have life in eternity with you. And Father, we want to give this time to you as we come and we study from your word. Speak to us in this morning. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Good morning, Bay City Church. We have a few announcements before we get into the message. During this season, we want to make sure that everyone is able to get plugged into a church family. If you are new to Bay City or simply haven't connected with us yet, we would like to invite you to be a part of our community. Simply visit baycitysf.info and click either First Time Submitting or Bay City is My Home Church. You'll be able to submit prayer requests, find out about serving opportunities, or get the Spotify playlist for our worship set. You can also find out more about how to be a part of our city groups. City groups are our midweek gatherings where we get to interact with other people from our church, study the Bible, and pray together. During this time, our city groups have all moved to gather online through Zoom. Join a group today at baycitysf.info. One of the ways in which we worship God is through giving. We serve a generous God, and we want to honor Him through our giving. That's why during this unusual time, we are giving 10% of our giving back to help people, organizations, and businesses that have been directly affected by COVID-19. You can give financially on baycitysf.info, or you can go to baycity.church give to set up one-time or recurring donations. You can also give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. We hope you partner with us in serving those in need. Even though we are not physically meeting together, we want to continue to be a church that prays together. We are hosting a prayer meeting through Zoom, and we would love for you to join us. Bring your prayer requests as we gather to pray for our city and for each other. You can find a link on our website. If you are looking for ways to go deeper into studying God's Word, visit baycity.church resources. Here you will be able to find a list of our recommended books and websites that will help you in your walk. Don't go at life alone. Connect with us now at baycitysf.info. Now go ahead and grab a Bible as we get ready to study God's Word. We're back, Bay City Church. Glad to see you again. Uh, happy summer. Uh, I'm not sure how much, well you're enjoying the summertime, but hopefully you can get some fresh air a little bit here and there and enjoy uh, the festivities and things like that, at least amongst your own family and friend, close, close friends or wherever you're sheltering in place with. Or I don't know what the rules are these days, for crying out loud. Anyway. I'm glad to see you again. We're in Philippians chapter 3, and so if you have a Bible, please grab that. I'm in the English Standard Version, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. So while you're grabbing your Bible, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get started talking about what it means to live our best life now. Or are we? We'll find out. Let's pray. Well, Lord, <clears throat> I pray for my voice that I can hold up. Um, I also pray that uh, my mind is ready and prepared to just give your word, Lord God. I pray that my humanity doesn't get in the way. Pray that the spirit is what uh, is communicating the uh, communicating this message. And I do pray for my friends, Lord, as they settle in. I'm not sure where they're at in this season. They may be in a tremendous season of happiness or joy. They also may have just been furloughed or laid off or just getting back to work. I'm not sure where they're at, Lord. Um, and that's the challenge of being far away from them right now. But I do pray for your spirit to just be present with us as we communicate, Lord, that you can work through the, through a camera, through an internet website, through a YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo or whatever it is. You can work through that. And so, Lord, we're praying for that to happen. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, the book of Philippians, as we've been saying over the last several weeks, is all about experiencing an underlying joy that we receive through Jesus, even in the midst of trying or difficult circumstances, right? And we're eight weeks into a 13-week series, and so hopefully you've gotten the picture that this book is all about joy in the midst of crisis. Well, very few people want to experience life suffering. We can all agree on that. Whether you're a Christian, a Buddhist, or an atheist, whatever you feel like you are, we all, can, we all can agree that no one really likes suffering. No one likes death. No one likes job loss. No one likes divorce. All are all hard things to grasp. In fact, very few people likes pain in general, except for maybe a few emu kids in middle school. I don't know. But no one likes suffering or pain. It's very difficult. So because this is the theme of the book, I have to just remind you again. I want to just give you the overall thesis of the book again. And here it is. Jesus is your way to real joy. Jesus is your way to real joy. 
You're thinking, great, thank you, pastor. Listen, that is the theme of this book. If I wanna be faithful to teaching the book of Philippians, I just wanna give you the obvious and clear picture on it. I, what I don't wanna do is pluck this book and then turn it into something it's not. I wanna make sure I give you the truth of the book. And so we're gonna go over and over and over again about joy. And again, this is not about happiness. It's not about pleasure. It's not about comfort, it's about joy. In order to be happy, in order to have pleasure, in order to have comfort, you have to change your external circumstances. Amen? In order to be comfortable, you gotta, have to, you gotta need, need a new couch. You want pleasure, you're gonna have to get some new ice cream, okay? But joy is not about external circumstances, it is about internal realities. Joy is different because external circumstances do not take joy away from us. Happiness can go with, uh, with external circumstances being changed, but not joy. <clears throat> This means that we may go through circumstances today, maybe like the last few months of this COVID-19 outbreak where life is more difficult and we may, we may go through these scenarios and we still can have joy even in the midst of it. Now, this is going to fly in the face of modern pop psychology, okay? It's going to fly in the face of it because suffering is just not part of the formula. If we want to live our best life now, let's put that on the screen, live your best life now, okay? If we want that, we're going to have to live a good, happy, positive, comfortable life, okay? Nothing of what Paul says. But man, doesn't it sound good? Oh man, <clears throat> live your best life now. It sounds so nice. I mean, after all, wouldn't it be nice to like live your perfect life now? Like if everything was perfect right now, wouldn't that feel good? Of course it feels good. But man, the realities of the world tell us this isn't always how it goes. And I'm not trying to be like a downer here. But the reality is life's hard. I mean, we've all been sheltered in place for months because of a pandemic. It's hard to live your best life now during that. Even if you have a mansion, <clears throat> it's hard. What if this phrase though was never, remember this phrase, what if this phrase live your best life now was never part of God's plan, at least not yet. What if it was not God's plan right this second? And what if as good as this phrase sounds, there's actually more joy without it right now coming? Paul helps us to understand in this context that perhaps our best life now is not the right life for us to find joy today. And as a disclaimer, before you feel like I'm a bummer, I just want to say this. For those of you who really enjoy this concept of living your best life now and you feel like that's something that's important to you, I want to say this. Living your best life now, the idea of it is not bad. What I believe living your best life now is, is a longing in you. It's a longing in you that we, where you really sense the world around you is not the way it should be, that you sense the relationships aren't the way they're supposed to be, where you sense the money and the time and the effort, the energy is all kind of disordered. Well, it is disordered. And you are longing for a world in which you could live your best life, where you would finally be in a place where you could be a good, happy, relatable, joyous person. You are longing for the kingdom of God that God is bringing. That's what you're longing for. And one day you will live that life. But until then, there's a better life to live that will prepare you for that life. And this is where we get this point. Joy is in Jesus, not people or circumstances. Joy is in Jesus, not people or circumstances. Now, was Jesus filled with joy? Do you think Jesus was joyous? Well, he was murdered. So, I mean, what does that do for our best life now theory? I mean, that's tough, but joy is in Jesus, not circumstances. And don't take it from me. Look at the Apostle Paul, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. He says who? Rejoice in who? The Lord. Rejoice, joy, have joy in the Lord. And then he says this really interesting phrase. He says, to write the same things to you is no trouble. Why does he say that? I think it's because he's been saying that the entire letter. He's been already saying, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, have joy in God, have joy in God, have joy in God. And yet I'm saying it to you again and you're going, oh, here we go again, the same sermon. I'm going, Paul says, this is no trouble for me to say this. And it's actually helpful for you. It's no trouble. It's helpful. I'm going to state it again with joy. That I'm going to state it again, that joy is found in an authentic, transforming relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> and you can find it in no other place. So don't get bored and start changing the message. Don't get bored that Jesus isn't enough and you want to look elsewhere like this next group of people does. Verse two, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. No, he seems like he's being rude, isn't he? 
Well, let me explain this for a second. These dogs he was referring to were not like pit bulls or something. He was actually talking about Judaizers. And Judaizers are Jewish Christians who introduced like additional prerequisites in order to be made right with God. And so they would take parts of the Old Testament and they would say, you've got to obey these certain parts of the Old Testament along with the saving foundation of Christ. And then that's how you are made right with God. And so you needed parts of the Mosaic law. You needed to be a practicing Jew. Certain Old Testament ceremonies and rituals were still binding. And also, they also taught that circumcision was still binding. <clears throat> and so when Paul says the mutilators of the flesh, he's actually being derogatory towards the Judaizers, saying they mutilate the flesh, meaning that they still circumcise people. Right, that's what he's talking about. They also taught that Paul was not even a real convert anymore and had removed certain requirements from God. And of course, they would believe that, right? Now, this word dog they use is a derogatory term, right? It's a common derogatory, derogatory term. But it was one often used by Jews talking about Gentiles. But here in a twist of genius irony, Paul is a Jew himself writing to Gentiles calling Judaizers dogs, Okay? Brilliant of Paul. He's using this language to conjure up imagery in their minds. So their Jewishness is what makes them dogs. Do you understand what he's getting at? It's powerful. Now, these Judaizers attempt to make the gospel message about their obedience to these extra portions of the law rather than just about Jesus. And this is the problem. And you know what this really means? Their source of joy, if they were to get it, is rests squarely on them. Their obedience to be to follow the law that they said is so necessary. If they want joy, they have got they've got to be obedient themselves. And if they're obedient and they and they do the work, then they'll have joy. It's thievery of joy is what it is. And let me bake this out a little bit more. Let me give you two types of thieves of joy. Let me give you two types. And here's my first joy thief. And this is the one we just talked about. Number one, the legalists. <clears throat> These are the legalists. Legalism exists when people attempt to secure righteousness to God through external means, like good works. Okay, this is a legalist. They believe that they can earn merit with God by their, through their behavior, through their performance, through their adherence to the law. That's what they believe. Okay, so let me put my legalist formula up on the screen for you. Here's, here it is. I behave. Okay, that means then I am more righteous. Then that means God loves me more. And then, if God loves me more, then I'm filled with more joy. So, if I behave, I become more righteous, then God loves me more, then I'm filled with joy. That's their formula. It's really long, it's really convoluted, and it's, there's a lot of I's in there, and a lot of me's in there, and a lot of my's in there. Because that's who it's surrounded around. It's not centered around Christ, it's centered around them. But the trouble with many legalists, and hey, I've been a tremendous legalist in the past. By God's grace, I hope I'm not one now. But I've been one that calls balls and strikes where the Bible just does not call balls and strikes. It is an, it's an abhorrent behavior to have. And I've been that person. And so if you're there right now, the trouble with you, <laughs> trouble with me, the trouble like people like us, is that many legalists, they're not just worried about their own behavior. They're always worried about other people's behavior too. This is the problem. We're the ones looking over the shoulder telling us, telling other people they're wrong. We're, we're those people. Many of us have been actually turned off by people like I was and people like maybe some of us have been because, and we've been turned off by them in church. And so we'll actually hit them over the head with the rule book of the Bible. And the Bible isn't the saving uh, word of life anymore. It's just a big book of rules that we use as a weaponry. <laughs> That's really what it is. And so they complain and they get angry at other people when they don't fulfill their rules. And the truth is, they don't just want people to be right with God. They want people to be right with them. And that's the difference between a legalist and someone who isn't a legalist. But I'm going to tell you right now, that is not God's path for joy. Legalism is, an, is no fun at all. It's not fun for the legalist, and it is not fun for the person getting the brunt of the legalist. And it's definitely not fun for Jesus. Legalists th steal joy, just like the Judaizers. Then there's this second uh, joy thief. And I'm going to call them the comfortist, the comfortist, okay? Now, these people, they're health, wealth, prosperity teachers, the word of faith movement. These are people that seem like they're telling you to how to have joy, but they're actually leading you towards something more like a surface level happiness or even positive thinking. <clears throat> and through these teachers, you're actually not getting real joy from them. You're just learning a path to get some sort of synthetic joy that will wear off in a few hours. 
So you go in, you hear the, the Tony Robbins like speaker and you get, you feel good and you go out and it fades quickly. Depending on, of course, on how fast you can acquire the comfort and possessions that you were said told to acquire. Not knocking Tony Robbins, okay? I'm just saying in general. <clears throat> By the way, these people exist inside the church and they exist outside the church. Now, my friend, not my literal friend, but our friend, let's call him Joel Osteen, he literally authored a book called Live Your Best Life Now. Literally authored the book. Um, well, I don't know if he literally authored it, but he, it was titled under his name, Live Your Best Life Now. And this essentially is the foundational message. The foundational message of this book is for you to mentally believe in something. And if you do it, it's possible for you. So if you can conjure up the possibility of you deserving it, then it's yours. If you want to be rich, you conjure it in your mind and you'll have it. You want to be wealthy, you want to have a new car, you want to have a new spouse, you want to move to a certain place, believe in the power of positive thinking and it will manifest for you. On page 35 of his book, Live, uh, Live Your Best Life Now, it says, God wants, you, wants to give you your own house. God has a big dream for your life. But what happens if you don't get that house? Did you not believe enough? Is God not looking after you? Look at page 82 of his book. It says this, God didn't make you to be average. God created you to excel. Therefore, if you will start acting like it, talking like it, seeing yourself as more than a conqueror, you will live a prosperous and victorious life. If you believe, if you start acting like, then you will have. You understand? And here he says this here, your focus determines your reality. Oh, wait, that wasn't Joel Osteen. That was Qui-Gon Jinn from Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Same exact message, different context. One's in Texas, one's in outer space. But this begs the question, though. This kind of just saying that to kind of all that to say. If Paul was in jail, was he failing his Christian walk? Was he failing his Christian walk? Did he not believe enough? What about Peter? You know, Peter was crucified upside down, history records. He didn't want to be crucified like Jesus. He was, felt like he was unworthy. So they crucified him upside down. What about the Apostle John, who was boiled alive and lived? Oh, man. Talk about a resilient guy, huh? What about James, who history records or the Bible records he was executed with a sword? Do these people not live their best lives now? These comfortists, they are similar to legalists, but instead of an outward code, there's an inward code. Instead of a you do, it's a you think, you believe. And if you believe hard enough, it will manifest. You wish upon that star hard enough, that car will be yours. Both of these though, the legalist and the comfortist, make today more valuable. The most valuable time on the world is now, not later, not tomorrow, not the future. One through the law and one through personal blessings and resources. Now, this would all be fine because here's the thing. There are worse things than being positive. No one's picking on Joel Olstein. There, there, there are few things, uh, there are many things worse in the world than just being a positive person. But these would all be fine except for the issue, though, that the Bible doesn't say any of this. The Bible doesn't say to live your best life now and name it and claim it. So people listen to this and they think, I will get healthy, I will get wealthy, and I'll get wise. And if I don't, and then they're going to blame God. Or when they should probably just blame their pastor. You know, six million people have actually bought your best life now, live your best life now. And a good portion of those people probably are going to walk away thinking that they just have read the Christian message of the gospel. And that's the hard part. They think that I understand the message of the Bible and it's me. I'm the message. I'm the point. Me, my success, my self-esteem, my car, my promotion, my job, my husband, me. I'm the center of the Bible. How American. Living your best life now, the, lo the longing for it, friends, again, is not a bad longing. But to manifest it today in a broken world is missing the point. There's a deeper joy we must find in order to live our best lives later. That leads me to the next point, which is this. Joy in people and circumstances, even today, isn't that great anyway? One of the foundations of many wealthy people is that they all say this, wealth and power isn't, doesn't ever provide me what I thought it would. It, it never gives me everything I thought it would be. Even Paul thought this, and he had quite the resume, by the way. Look at verse four. It says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If, 
any, uh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. <clears throat> but whatever, I, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul knew that being a well thought of citizen, having authority and prestige that in that day wasn't enough, even though that was like being the peak human being for the Israelite, for, for the, for the uh, Jew then. It was. That was what you could be. That was the most amazing thing you could be. It's like being Justin Bieber or, or I don't know, Prince or the Queen or something in England or Barack Obama or something, a movie star. That was the, the cream of the crop. You couldn't have Jeff Bezos. That was who you could be. Jim Carrey, <clears throat> it was a movie star. For my younger audience, he was in a lot of good movies back then, okay? He uh, wrote himself a check for $10 million in 1985. It's a true story. He wrote himself a check and said, for acting services rendered, he put it in his wallet and dated it for 10 years in the future. Really cool story. 10 years later, almost to the month, Jim Carrey gets a check for $10 million to star in the movie Dumb and Dumber, which is one of my favorite movies. Powerful story about manifesting Man, he, he, he named it and he claimed it and he manifested it. And you might think, man, that's a really cool story. And listen, there's nothing wrong with earning money. Earning money is a great thing, especially when you utilize your resources to take care of your family, to leave a legacy, and to give generously. Man, get, earning money is a great thing. But even Jim Carrey says this, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Now, if Jim Carrey, a secular thinker and actor and comp comedian can say that, and certainly Paul knew that, writing this part of the text. So where does that leave us then, friends? Well, it, bring, it leaves us right back at the beginning. Joy is in Jesus, not in people or circumstances. Just like Paul says in the beginning, it is no, of no trouble to me to preach to you the same things. I feel like I have to do the same thing to you. Guys, it is no trouble to me to preach the same exact message to you, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by him. And that if you seek life, he is the answer. And that you need to taste and see that the Lord is good. That is the truth. It is no, no trouble to me to say that to you again. Look at verse 8. Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Rubbish. Maybe some English people got in on the translation of the ESV. Really, that just means garbage, trash, refuse. You get what I'm saying? Garbage, trash, refuse. Rubbish is a very funny way to say it. But he's essentially saying this. My entire resume, my money, my fame, my, my Instagram feed, my Twitter feed, my YouTube channel, I count it all as rubbish, as trash, as garbage. That's a lot of good things to count as garbage. What did you do with your trash this past week? What did you do with your trash? Here's what you did with it. You put it in a can that is so disgusting you can't keep it in your house. And then you bring it to a corner once a week for some stranger to take. <laughs> That's what you did with your trash. Paul is saying, Jesus is so important and powerful in my life that I counted all of my most valuable assets about myself as trash that I might gain Christ. That's what he means. The gospel is not about getting more and more stuff for the, today's life and to be more prosperous. It is about God forgiving people of their sin through the death of his son and then bringing them back to life after they were being spiritually dead. Our belongings and statuses and Instagram feeds do not bring people back from the dead. But Jesus does. And that's the joy in Jesus that can make a man take what we treasure in this world and count it as old takeout food containers and th to be discarded. That's what it means. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Wow. And may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. By faith, you can experience the joy of what it meant to be dead and to rise from the grave, killing the fast pleasures of this world. Instead of living your best life now, trying to get the best you can out of this broken world, you can sell your soul to Christ 
to be in chains for him and to labor alongside him so that you can actually get the most out of that sentence when to live your best life now. You want to live your best life? It comes later. And so this life, we live with joy and a longing knowing that one day I will get to live my best life now. But I'm telling you what, friends, if you want to try to live your best life now, there's still going to be suffering, pain, and death. But you can live with joy now knowing that one day the best life will come and it comes in him. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray for my friends who long for their best lives. You do have an ability to give it to us, Lord, and you're ushering it forward through the kingdom of God. And we have a role to play in that, and that's to suffer well in this world, to serve, live for the betterment of others, to do our best to enjoy the pleasures that this world has so that one day you can renew and redeem and restore the world back to the way you originally wanted it to be and to grant us our best lives in you. And those best lives are going to, not going to be filled with all the things we think. It's going to be filled with your presence. And for that, we cannot wait. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Bay City. Go with the grace of God. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may the light of Christ Jesus shine on you this week as you go. Just to praise, to glorify and glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. And not just to praise, to glorify and glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand against. And this I Father, through all of our circumstances, we want to sing that. We choose to praise you. We choose to honor you. We choose to obey you. And Lord, we ask that throughout this week, you would give us the strength, the peace, and the patience, Lord, to be honoring to you with our actions and with our lives. We love you so much, and it is in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, Bay City. We love you. It was a great Sunday worshiping with you, church family. Remember, don't go at life alone, especially during this unique season. Connect with us at baycitysf.info and plug in with us so we can all stay encouraged and joyful together. We want to hear from you. See you next week.